few weeks ago, the Lord posed this question to me, and it's almost a reversal concerning what normally we ask the Lord. He was asking me back. We normally pray, Lord, what is your will? We know that Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, which was actually the prayer for the disciples, said uh, in that prayer is, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us mirror, if you will, the will of God in heaven on earth. I heard the Lord say to me is that it's not hard for you to find my will because it's written all the way through the book, but I need to know from you what is your will. Isaiah said, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. That just didn't mean have a fat paycheck. It means that if there's a willingness to obey God because the, our will is so connected to obeying the Lord that you can't separate the two. So it's the idea that God is saying, I'm willing, but the question is, are you willing? And Alex had mentioned, you know, the pool of Bethesda. Jesus walks in to the five porches, which was known as Bethesda there. And uh, history tells us that each porch was basically a diseased or infirm group of people. There were some people that the diseases, they had to be isolated, and they were one porch, and there was other people that couldn't walk in another porch. And so you just found your tribe of infirmity, and you, and you hung with them. There's some people that they know more about their infirmity than they know about God. And so Jesus walks into there and found a paralytic, and he says to him, will you be made whole? Pose the question. Jesus was saying, are you willing? I have already established that I'm willing, but are you willing? And the man never answered Jesus. He said, well, Lord, I've, I've been here a long time, paraphrasing, probably because he was closer, the pecking order as he, time gone on, you there longer. And he said to him, right when the angel of the Lord comes down, which was the traditional time, they were waiting on a, a particular response that they had learned from their past. They had become so learned about a particular thing that they missed a different move of God. That they always saw that once a year, we're waiting for that year, we don't know when that happens, but when the angel comes down, he's going to literally brood over the, the waters as, as in Genesis 1 when the Holy Spirit came and inseminated or brought life into the waters. And the first person into the water after the angel came and moved over the waters was healed. So the man, instead of saying, yes, Lord, I want to be healed, he started giving him his past history of all the issues going on in his life and missed the one main thing Jesus said, I simply ask you. It's like going up and asking someone, how are you doing today? And they tell you all the bad stuff that's happened in the last 20 years. And all I want to know, how are you doing? You're like, hello. He said, well, I, right when it's my time to get into the water, someone else beats me to it. It's so easy to give reasons and excuses why something doesn't happen when we know it's God's will to do it. I was going to do this, but somebody got my way, and I was ready to step into this ministry, and somebody else, you know, took that place, and right when something was good was going to happen, you know, the enemy came or something happened, I lost the finances and so couldn't do it, and so we have so programmed, and our thinking is to why something can happen instead of the simple thing that he's asking us, are you willing? Find in Matthew where... Jesus is coming late in the evening and, and he's walking on the water and, and Peter wasn't sure that it was Jesus, but he sees him out there and he said, Lord, if it is you, bid me or permit me or invite me to come. And Jesus answered back to him, it is I. Once Peter heard that, he was now responsible for what Jesus said, game on. Your turn. Tag, you're it. What are you going to do with it? Jesus didn't say, Peter, he said, it is I come. Anybody that, had a, that was in the boat that had an ear to hear what Jesus said could have gotten out of the boat. Amen. But it, it was necessary for them to say, I am willing, but notice and saying, I'm willing to do this, but never do it. Peter not only said when he heard that, that he could do it, he had permission from the Lord to do it. Then the next thing was for him to obey and step out and be, began to walk on the water. He did for a little bit anyway. And then all of a sudden he realized, I'm human. I, this isn't for me. Circumstances began to dictate to him, you're crazy. 
probably his fellow brothers in the boat was saying, Peter, what are you doing, man? You know you can't do that. Oh, I can't? Okay. Or you hear a word, I'm healed, and everybody else tells you, nah, that's never been done before. Well, the Lord healed me. Nah, that, I, I think it's symptomatic. You have the symptomatic that you're healed, but you're really not healed. The enemy always comes to change the narrative and the conversation between us and God. As it was in the very beginning in Genesis 1, when God had already laid out the plan and saying, here's the tree of life, here's the tree of good and evil. He didn't tell them that they couldn't eat of the tree of life. He just said, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I put these parameters in the garden to see where your heart is. And the, and the serpent came, devil was working through him. Scholars say the devil was, or the serpent actually was walking on his hind feet at that time as an animal. And he comes and says to them, uh, I want to change the conversation, my, par- my paraphrase. And I want to just suggest a thought to you, did God really say? Did God really heal you? Did God really say for you to do this? Because when God says something, do it doesn't mean that it's easy. It just means I'm going to walk you through it. We tend to have the idea that when something is difficult, it wasn't God. And when it's really easy, it must be God. Huh? Boy, I had an easy time. Must have been God. Well, it's easy to go to hell. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that path that leads to life. So he said, would you pray that I'll have an easy time? Well, I like it when it's easy. But I know when it's not easy, I'm still on the will of God. I've been on airplanes going to foreign countries and had a rough time getting there. And then some people say, well, it must be the devil fighting you there. Well, it may just be a bad day for planes. <laughs> we either have to say, well, the devil did it or God did it. Why not just the fact is I'm going to walk through it Amen. and I'm going to give God the glory no matter whether it's natural or, or, or spooky. However it is, I'm going I'm to walk through it either way. I'm not going to stop and say, look what the devil has done. I'm just going to keep my eyes focused on the Lord. And as it were, the book of Acts and the song of the Lord that came Frankie this morning, Paul and Silas in the prison, they could have stopped and said, you know, look what the devil's trying to do to us. And, or it could have said, Paul, you got me into this. I was fine until I followed you on this journey. There's a tendency, if we don't know the will of God, we start blaming people in the process based on the circumstances. And what if the circumstances was building us up along the way so we could get to the right outcome? If it was easy, we'd go through it and not even think anything about it. But when God delivers you after one thing, after the other, after the other, after the other, and you look back and say, if it wasn't for God, I couldn't have gone through this. God is more interested, I think, in the process than just, than just the bottom line of the result of that. He takes us from glory to glory and, you know, between the, when, in the hallway is hell. He takes from one room to the other, but in the hallway, that passage, there's hell. So when you go through the hallway of hell, don't stop because you're going somewhere else. Don't get bogged down in the issue at the hand. So I'm going to share this morning about something how that Not only is it necessary for us to know the will of God, but it's necessary for God to know our will. Because he put full authority into mankind on the earth, and Adam had that full authority, Adam had the right to give it away in the garden, or he had the right to resist it. It was all belonging to him. When God placed him there and gave him authority and dominion over the animals and everything inside that garden, and everything inside that garden, including the serpent, including the devil that he had authority over, but it was his choice or his will that got involved inside. I choose to take another thought. I choose to step outside of what God's saying and move in another direction. So when it comes back to this point of, of God doing something, he still has left authority in the earth, and he's saying, are you willing? What do you want in this? And yet many times we're praying, God, what's your will? What's your will? What's your will? Is it your will for me to get that job or go to another job? What's your will? And yet the bigger will that we need to look at is the fact is, am I bringing pleasure to the Lord because it's God's will that none should perish, that all shall come to the knowledge of the Son of God? So I want to talk about what a ministry for believers are. I work with a lot of pastors. We oversee a number of churches. Diane and I will see about 70 leaders Uh, outside of Tyler here Monday 
coming together for refreshing and some beat up and some just looking for direction, some just looking for fellowship. In the course of all dealing with leaders, I find out sometimes they get bogged down into what their ministry is and they miss out what their main ministry of everybody is. And that's a ministry of a believer. Not whether you're gifted, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, that comes out of that. But the ministry of the believer says in the, talking about in the last days, and we're in the last days after resurrection is the last days. We're getting closer because of the, the imploding, if you will, of our culture and so on like that. But I remember it was the last days when I was born. We're still in the last days. But it's the last days where we, the grace abounds in a greater way. He says that believers shall lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. If I'm more concerned about what my identifying gifting is and I lose the idea that my calling is being a believer or a son, then I have lost the very reason why Jesus gave me authority. He said believers shall lay hands on the, tr on the sick and they'll recover. He said, all authority is given in heaven and earth unto him. So when Jesus breathed on them right before he ascended, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'm giving you authority that you can cast out demons. And if you drink any deadly thing and pick up serpents, which is talking about the demonic, doesn't mean go find a snake and see what you can do with him. It's talking about the demonic realm. That when you, you find that and they snip at you, it won't hurt you. You're, you're going to have this immunity walking with us in the Spirit of God. The believer's ministry has to be for the church. But if all we have held down is the ministry that happens in between the four walls, before, between the hours in 10 and 12, and sometimes we go over that, then, then we have missed what the believer's ministry is. As a believer, you carry inside of you, not the purpose just to come on Sunday morning and hear somebody preach to you, but you imparted, empowered, downloaded into your spirit. So wherever you go, you're going to encounter opportunities on the job, in the market, wherever you are. And wherever you are, there he is. Amen. So, well, we don't have two or three gathered together. Yeah, you do. You've got the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. They're gathered together. <laughs> Matthew 18 talks about two or three gathered together. It was restoring somebody that had, had fallen away. You always have the Trinity or the anointed of the Godhead inside of you to do whatever's necessary. The issue is, am I willing at all times to be a believer or am I only a believer when I need something from God? If I see somebody walking through the store and all of a sudden, man, I, my compassion hits you, that compassion is the anointing of the Holy Spirit and says, kick in. I'm willing, are you willing? Well, I don't know what they believe, but I don't know what they think. And Well, you're not willing. If you're willing, I'm willing, and then obedient, and move towards that, then you'll eat the good of the land, which means you will see the goodness of God in the land of your living. You establish that place as a platform for the presence of God at that moment. We are in a believer's generation revival. It's not about some great ministries or some people that God's highlighted and all that. Ephesians 4.11 are to train other people to do the work of the ministry. Train other believers to do believer ministry. The ministry of the believer is to show forth the goodness of God. And one of the ways that he tells us is when he announced his entrance into the Hebrews because Israel had, or the Hebrews at that time, they weren't, they weren't a nation. They had never heard of Yah or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he had, Moses comes in and says, I announce to you a God. We well, have to realize how many gods that Egypt had. He said, I represent the God of your fathers. Well, they had lived in Egypt all of their life. They didn't know anything. They, the golden calf was there. So they was in front of them all the time. And, he, and God announced to them, how would you, if nobody's ever heard of you, how would you announce yourself? I am the Lord thy God that heals you. The first thing that I want you to know is my compassion and my mercy is to take care of you and to reveal my compassion over you to bring healing to you. But for so many people, we think, I know God can, but I don't know if he will. Lord, if that's you, it's me, then allow me to come. Lord, if that's you, then I believe it is you, then heal me. So it's a matter of that 
we believe that God can, but his will and his willingness needs to be also inside of us. And there's an impartation of the will of God coming to us so that it meets with our will and our will becomes his will. So we don't have to second guess it when the Lord says, there's someone, go, go minister to them. He says, yes, I will. Part of the being in an army culture, and I didn't grow up in the military, but I tell you, the first thing they do is break you down so much so to where that you're not going to second guess an officer's orders. My brother, I remember going in the army, and he said, I spent the whole first few months learning how to make a bed. My mother said, well, you didn't do it at home, so why do you think they're going to do it there? But the purpose was to get them to do it exactly the way that their specifications were, and if you didn't, then there was a consequence for it. So that the reason you get out on the battlefield and that officer says, charge that hill, you're not going to think, my mama don't want me to do that. <laughs> I've never done that before. But you've been trained for the discipline. You're saying, I will. My will has been so broken and submitted to you, I'm not questioning you anymore, God. God, why do you want me to do this? What difference does it make why? We spend all of our time asking God, why, 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 why? Instead of saying, show me how and I'll do it. I'll figure it out on the way. I'll jump out there and trust you, oh God, because trust is moving in a way that I don't have to see the details, but I'm just moving in that way. The, the, the church of believers has to be a church that we don't spend our time questioning everything that God is saying and doing. We just simply say, I don't know why God does. He just does it. I don't know what God, why God just enjoys us lifting our hands, but he says it in his word. But for a lot of people, they've got to figure it out with their head and their mind, and they never have an impartation of the Spirit of God because their head or their will, if you will, sukikos, gets in the way, and it said, doesn't make sense. If I was God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get off on that. Well, for some reason, God likes the idea of obedience that breaks us down and causes us a brokenness and brokenness in our own will that so he can do his will. Listen to me. When we don't find ourselves submitted to the will of God, we will find other people that are and get from them. We will start looking to other people for our source. We'll look to other people to be the givers. We look to other people to do it because instead of coming to my father... Instead of submitting myself to my father, he says, I want to be Jehovah, Jehovah Yireh, Jireh to you, might be your provider. But you've looked to others because your will has not ever been given over. When I was a young kid, I told the story before, and the lady across the street, she made cookies on a certain day, and, and I wanted some cookies, so I just knocked on the door. She was very eccentric. People were afraid of her. They thought she was a witch. I didn't think so, because she made good cookies. I mean, a witch couldn't make those good cookies. Which cookies? <laughs> so I knocked on the door. Her name is Miss Mike Sell. And I said, Miss Mike Sell, I haven't eaten in three days. <laughs> she said, well, Carrie, I lived right across the street. I'm so sorry. Come on in. I can smell those cookies. So I ate those cookies and so on. And she didn't, she didn't hang out with anybody very much. And one day, for some reason, she was at the store ran into my dad. She said, how's Carrie doing? <laughs> well, he's fine. Well, he came over the other day and said he hadn't eaten in three days. He said, what? <laughs> she said, thank you for, he said, thank you for telling me. He went home, came home, and I didn't feel like eating for the next three days. Let me tell you that. <laughs> didn't want to sit down. He said, that was so embarrassing to me that you went to the neighbors telling about your need and your hunger and you didn't come to me. That'll preach. How many times we tell everybody else our problems, everybody else issues, and God's the last one to hear about it? It's because we want, to, we want to look to other people to be our source and resource, drag the sack and say, please, please help me. I don't mind people saying, pray for me if there's a real need, but if saying, pray for me because I haven't eaten in three days. But when we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher, we've come into a, a believer's mode knowing that if he has to send the ravens, if he's got to show it up some other way, it'll be from him and not from my manipulation in any way. We either trust God or we're going to trust flesh. And if we're going to see the supernatural anointing of the Holy Spirit move in our lives, we're going to have to trust the Spirit of God, not the flesh of man. I hadn't even got to the text yet. Woo, help me along. Turn with me to, to Matthew, the eighth chapter. 
Maybe one of those continued things. Who knows? Tracy Stewart will be here next week. That'll be exciting. Yes. She'll be awesome. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. When he, when he had come down from the mountain, speaking of Jesus, great multitudes followed him. He was in a secluded area, been with the Lord, the Father, ministering to the Lord. He comes down. Behold, a leper came and worshipped him there, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus put out his hand and touched him and saying, I am willing. Notice there's a, he wasn't saying, Lord, uh, if, you, if you will heal me. Jesus said, he said to him, if you're willing. And Jesus said back to him, I am willing. There was the will of those two people that connected. Now the backstory is pretty awesome. This fact that, that lepers were considered such a low class of citizenry that they were not even allowed inside the city. They had to depend on other people bringing food, dropping it off. They couldn't even meet with their family. They were not only the outcasts of society, they were the outcasts from their own families. Because of their sickness and disease, it was very contagious. Leprosy was a plague of the day. It was also considered by some, you know, the Pharisees considered a demonic thing. And if you had leprosy, it was, what have you done to make God mad? And they were, they seen this way. This man to even get this close to Jesus was risking it all. Because at that moment that he had come to Jesus and people had turned him into the, the priest because the Levitical priesthood, according to in Leviticus the chapter 13, had a whole huge laws about how to deal with the leprosy. But he said, Lord, if you are willing, knowing I, it's your will, but Jesus said back to him, I am willing. He recognized the will of God. He didn't say to him, if it be your will, he wasn't asking, will you heal me? He just said, I recognize by your will something can happen. And his will was so moved by the obedience that he came and submitted himself there. And there was a, a power of the Holy Spirit that was released in that. Here's my point to this. Faith begins. And here's the, here's the thing that's rocked my, my world for about a week. Faith begins when his will is known. Faith begins when his will is known. Once we know the will of God, something happens inside of us. And faith is the word that is not, a, not a, a descriptive word. It's a noun that moves you to do something. Your faith has made you whole. It wasn't just a believing in. Your faith, you moved towards me. You risked it all coming up to Jesus within a, within a hundred feet. And Jesus touched you. How dare you do that? And then Jesus told him, go and show yourself to the priest as satisfied with the law of Moses. But he says to him, don't tell anybody. I've heard messages on that. Oh, Jesus knew that he'd go tell everybody because when you tell someone not to do something, they're going to break their neck to do it. That wasn't the reason why Jesus said it. He said, don't tell anyone. Just go offer the sacrifice that Moses required and present yourself to priest. Because if the, if the priest finds out it was me, Jesus, doing it, they will not agree that you've been healed and not certify your restoration and putting back into the community because they're resisting everything that Jesus did. Yes. The same way it was so political, don't tell them that party's doing it because the other side won't, won't accept it and do it, even though it's true. So Jesus was saying for the sake of that man, don't tell them because they'll reject the certification because his whole life, his livelihood, his, his family depended on him being certified by the local priest that you are healed. You're no longer a threat to, to society. The believer's ministry is to silence the, the power of the enemy speaking to people and causing them to fear. The believer's ministry is to break off the affliction off of people's lives that have debilitated them from their families and kept them outside of the will of God, that has messed with their marriages, that have messed with their kids and messed with their lives. So what's a church to do? Not just to gather people together and give you some sermon. It's to saying we're to heal the sick, cast out demons, and proclaim the kingdom of God. That is the believer, not just the pastor's ministry. It is all those who carry the authority of God. But if all I do is have a Bible study and tell them about what we could do or should do, and I never do it, it's about I'm always learning but never coming to the knowledge of truth. Truth is a person. Truth is not information. It's like saying, I'll pray about it. Why do you need to pray about the will of God? He says, cast the demons out. Well, I'll pray about it. 
You already know the will of God. What I'm saying is I'm procrastinating or postponing the will of God because I know if I step out in that, I don't know I'm trust, I really trust him to see it manifested. A number of years ago, I was in Africa, first time trip to Africa. Um, it's a long, I'll make a long story shorter. I was on my way to Ghana, and, um, and I went. They wouldn't give me a visa. said, Americans have been killed in Ghana going over at that time. There's no visas given to you. So I went to the American embassy, and I said, I need a visa for Ghana. And he said, we're not, we're not issuing visas for Ghana. And I said, yeah, that's what I hear. He said, you're a fool for wanting to go. And I said, maybe so. And I'd only gone two weeks, and we were tired and doing crusades and ministry and all that gone with that. So I thought, oh, praise God, I get to go home. I sent a telegram to the pastor that was there. In fact, it's actually Sister Anderson's son, Wickware, you remember some of her. And told him, I'm not coming. They won't give me a visa. I'm going back home. Had $1,000 that I was trying to get to him because the, the black market uh, couldn't buy any food in the country. It was very impoverished that time. So I was resting thinking, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow and I'm heading home. The Holy Spirit woke me up in the middle of the night. I just felt the bed shaking. Woke me up in the middle of the night and said, I told you to go to Ghana. And I said, I know, but they won't give me a visa. Now, when you're trying to discuss something with God, he's very narrow on his approach. <laughs> he doesn't give you details. He simply said, I said, go to Ghana. And I said back to him, I don't have a visa. The third time he said, I said, go to Ghana. And I said, I'm willing, Lord. Just tell me what to do. Now we have instruction. Yeah. Because if I'm not willing to, and my mind was set on going back home, then why have any detail? He said, go to the airport tomorrow and stand and see the salvation of the Lord. So I went to the airport, put my ticket up there, had all the luggage with me. And the guy came up and looked at the ticket and he said, um, you don't have a visa. And I said, that's right. He said, you, you crazy Americans, you come over here and you think that you'll just get whatever you want. Sort of. <laughs> and I, said, I, I won't tell him, I said, the one who created you sent me here. So I just backed up and I said, told you. And the Lord said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Hallelujah. So I was standing still. My brother was saying, was with me. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. When you don't know what else to do, don't do anything. Amen. That means God saying, I'll move now. I just need you to show up, suit up, and see what I'll do. Yes. About that time, two African guys, big guys, Hulk guys, just started getting into a fist fight right next to me. I mean, they were just bamming one another. Bam, bam, bam. They were hammering. I mean, it called jackhammering. Bam, 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 bam. And I thought, I'm not going to get involved there. They, they look like they know it must be a cultural thing. I don't know. The agent that was so upset with me jumped out behind there, went over and broke the fight up. Another agent came up behind him, and he looked at me and says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm trying to go to Ghana. He said, the plane's leaving now. Go get on it right now. He said, I got your luggage. I'm on there saying, praise God. Thank you for doing this, Lord. And all the while, I'm, because I'd never been overseas at that point, and I was thinking, well, God, you really did this. Wow. And then it dawned on me, I still don't have a visa. <laughs> You tricked me, God. You're going to get me over there and throw me in jail. Nobody will ever hear me before. I've heard stories how they kill people over there. The Americans are not liked over there anymore. So you're going to do it to me. What did I do to deserve this? So I, you know, we bound the devil a few times, you know, and thought just cover my bases just in case. Of course, I'd sent a telegram to the pastor saying, I'm not coming, so he's not going to be there. There was no cell phones. Nobody knew anything, and I was just a dumb kid you know, trying to be overseas and just ignorant. So I told my brother, as we get separated, just tell him you want to go to the American consulate. He said, what's that? And it's kind of like a fast food thing. You just kind of go in there and they give you something. So we stepped up there and I stepped right through the door. The table is five feet in front of me where I had to declare that I had a visa, custom, you know, immigration. And somebody reached up behind the door, grabbed my arm, and I like to went out of my skin. I looked around, it was the pastor. I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I came to pick you up. I said, well, I sent you a telegram telling you I wasn't coming. He said, what'd you do that? And I said, because I don't have a visa. And he goes, oh my, how'd you get here? And I said, you won't believe it. <laughs> he said, hand me your passports. And we kind of held out and got out of the side of there. And he took our passports and came back in five minutes and had visa stamped in the passport. 
for free. He said, a couple of weeks ago, the head of immigration got saved in one of our schools, uh, of the Church of the Bible School, and said it's, it was Saturday. Normally, he doesn't work on Saturday, but the person normally working on Saturday got sick at the last minute, and nobody could come in but this guy. Here's your visas. And I said, well, I got $1,000 here that belongs to you. And he said, don't show it now. They'll take it from you. So he, they, they grab my briefcase and turn it upside down. And all of a sudden, $1,000 and $20 bills start floating down everywhere. <laughs> they started telling me that they were going to arrest us and they were going to strip search us. And my brother, ain't nobody taking my clothes off. And I said, well, <laughs> see that guy with a gun right there? I think he could do it. <laughs> so I just said, Lord, you brought us this far. And so the missionary said, these men are the men of the most high God. If you touch their bodies, the God that they serve will strike you blind. And I said, yeah, what he said. <laughs> they turned us loose. And the Lord, I walked through that and the Lord sang, because you were willing and obedient, I'll do the rest. But don't question how will it be done. Part of the process of believing that God is saying, I don't even have to know. Angel, the Lord speaks to Mary. You're going to have a son. I don't even know how it's going to happen. Just believe him. Say, let it be unto me according to your word. Now, here's part of the issue. Jesus had another time of healing. And uh, we find it in Matthew, the seventh chapter. Ten lepers this time. Comes out and... Pick it up, verse 21. And he comes to him and he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. This is, this is a different time than the lepers. Come to me, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And we cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare, this Jesus, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, or iniquity is the word. There's two groups that's read that, uh, in this parable. There's one group that says, Lord, you're my Lord, and never do anything. Jesus said, I don't even know you. There's another group that had just enough truth to go out and do something and saw the demonstration of the Word of God done, but they had no relationship with Him. In either case, Jesus said, I don't even know you. But this is what He said. Those who know the will of the Lord, those who obey me. Now, if you go into John 10, He says, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. One translation says they obey me. My sheep know my voice. You, they know the will of God. And then the second part is they will follow or obey me. One of the reasons why it's difficult for some people to know the voice of God is because we've gotten so used to not following what he says. You do that long enough to where you can't even hear him anymore. Dying calls it selective hearing. I heard you. I was getting around to it. She said, well, you didn't acknowledge that you heard me. It's true. You text me and you didn't text me back, so I don't know if you heard me or not. Sometimes it's a one way it becomes a monologue instead of dialogue. If God texts you and said, you want to be healed, and he said, okay, God's willing to heal me. But I don't text him back and say, yes, Lord, I'm willing. So there is a, there are, there is a dialogue that happens from heaven to earth. Let your will be done on earth. 2 Corinthians 4 and 6 says that we are earthen vessels, that the excellency of God is not of us, but of him. So he said, let it be done in these earthen vessels as it is in heaven. So he recognized the will of God and the obedience of God as two different things. I've heard, I've heard people say, God spoke to me, but I just didn't do it. I didn't do it. As to say, boy, I said, that's stubbornness. And stubbornness became, can become like witchcraft. Stubbornness to God doesn't gain anything. I've tried. It doesn't accomplish anything. God is not moody. He's not like your mother that said, I'll run away from home. I've tried that too. And he said, wherever you go, there I am. So what else are you going to do? 
But the only thing that he responds to is, if you love me, you'll keep my commandment. You'll respond to me by act of obedience. In essence, he's saying, if we say he's Lord and not do what he says, it means nothing. Our identity is not so much in what we say, but in what we do. He said, you'll know the tree by the fruit it produces. And for God, obedience is huge. Obedience is bigger than sacrifice. So he's saying, if you're really my sheep, you not only hear what I'm saying, but you're going to do. I had people call me up and say, the Lord spoke to me that we need to do such and such and such. I said, sounds like a word to you. Oh, yeah, God gave me this word. If it's a word to you, then the obedience has to be by you. Your word to me does not require obedience on my part because I'd only be obeying you. I have people all, all times given ideas what Trinity should be and shouldn't be and all that kind of thing. So you come to this point of saying, I, if I hear it for myself, I'm responsible and saying, when I obey, it is saying, I honor you as Lord. And that is the, the key that breaks the power of the enemy. Last week or so, I uh, or last time, I don't know when that was, a few weeks ago, I was giving you the Hebrew word for, for obey. It's made up of three, lever, three letters, and I think it's so interesting, I want to repeat it into this context. The first letter is in Hebrew is called skein, S-K-E-E-N, and it means to crush. The second word is the word mem, E-M-E-M, confusion, it means confusion, and ayin means to see or understand. So when you put that words together, it means to obey, means to crush, confusion, so I can see and understand. In other words, you want to know what God wants you to do? He said, obey, you'll crush the confusion, and you'll be able to see and understand what I have in store for you. When the Lord spoke to me as an 18-year-old concerning what he's called me to do, I had no grid for it, I had no training for it, I had no background for it. All that he needed from me is saying, all right, I don't know how we'll do this, but nonetheless, we'll try it and see. My responsibility is not to figure it out. Only my responsibility says, yes, my will, let your will now be in my will and a partnership and we'll see something come. And obedience had to come. The first thing was that they came to me and said, I, I want you to teach the adult class. And I said, I'm not ready for that. I'm just a kid. My mother was in the class. All the adults were in the class. It was adult Bible class, school. I mean, these were meat eaters. They were carniv carnivores, carnivores. And they would eat me up. And I had never preached and done anything. Pastor threw me right out in the deep water with the sharks. I wasn't a particular a good studier of the word. I was put in a situation where God says, all I want to know, are you willing and I knew if I backed off at that moment, that would be the end of it. I would settle for just me meager leftovers. And I said, God, I'll do it one, with one reason. You don't bargain with God, but he knew my heart. And I said, if I'll not, I mean, if you'll always give me the meat. He said, if you're hungry for meat, I'll not give you a, 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 you know, a serpent. So I went for it. It put me in a situation that the obedience caused a lot of stress. I mean, I was staying up late Saturday nights. I had a business working six days a week. Stayed up late Saturday night, digging in, digging in, until all of a sudden, aha, came to me. Because I didn't want to go into that meeting with a, you know, lay me down to sleep thing. <laughs> when we say, yes, Lord, I'm willing, and then to make the first steps in obedient, then the anointing comes in. Right. He doesn't give us the anointing to do nothing. The anointing is the divine enablement to do beyond what our own natural ability can be. And for people that's really into their own head and very intellectual, sometimes it's hard for them to trust God. And so they don't see God doing anything. And they just determine in their own life that's not what it is. He, first of all, like in the military, breaks us down to where we're no, no longer questioning why. Why did you allow that to happen? Why did you do that, God? How come you didn't heal them? How come this didn't take place? Because he's God and you're not. The simplicity is all he's asking is for. Walk with me as a believer and these signs will follow you. And if I pray for 100 people and 99 get sick and die, does that change the assignment? No. My job is not to see how many and keep tabs on nickels, novices, numbers. My job is simply to say, I'm walk with God and I did what you've asked me to do and the results belongs to you, Lord. 
Because I've gone to places where they were hard enough to crack. And if I measure when I should be there, not based upon what I saw with that, then man, I think I missed God on that. Here's what's, here's what's interesting with this. 1 John 3, 8. This is my mission. This is the mission of Trinity. It's the mission of every believer. It says, for this very purpose, the Son of Man, Jesus, was made manifest, unveiled as God. God came down in, fle- in a skin. Just when Adam failed, it took the skin of animals to cover Adam. So God sent his Son incarnate and put skin on him. He shows up in skin, flesh and blood with us. And then that skin, flesh, and blood laid down his life and blood was shed. Just like there was a shedding of the blood for Adam and Eve to be covered in the old covenant. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about Jesus, the second Adam or last Adam, I should say as well. That he gave up his skin, his flesh, his blood so that we could live, not just live and based upon the cross, but live out of the resurrection. We are, you and I, are the body of the anointed. Doesn't mean your body because you attend a church somewhere. Well, that's, I think that should be. Anybody that doesn't have a church home and, and have accountability, then I look at, I'm not going to place myself under that ministry. But we have the body of the anointed. That means we step into him spiritually. And as he, so as, as he is, so are we right now. He's given us the same anointing to heal the sick, to cast out lepers. lepers. The only thing that he needs from us is a willing heart and an action of obedience. And then the spirit of Christ, the anointed one, kicks in. I thought about many times, if I just refused, I'm not going to Ghana, I would have probably settled for something a lot less. And I settled for missing out and seeing, having walked out before me and having confidence in a greater dimension of what God can do. Every time that you obey God, there's a revelation of him in it. Is it possible for us to say, Lord, Lord, and not have a relationship with him? I think there is. Is it possible for us to say, Lord, Lord, I've done all of these things. I've even had done these ministries and I stand before him and say, I don't know who you are. You've done things for me, but you've never done things through me. You were busy doing the ministry. You were busy raising funds. You were busy trying to figure out how you're going to make a living in the ministry. I, I deal with these pastors, leaders all the time. You were busy, 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 busy working for me and never took time to come in and saying, why am I doing this? It's because I want to have an intimate relationship with him. So when I stand before him, he says, I know you. Not by how busy you've been, but I know you because the blood of Jesus has sealed you. The power of the Holy Spirit has sealed you. Nowadays, you can get more information about the Word of God on the Internet like like never before. There's some wild things out there, crazy things out there. Some people just say things for shock value. Like, wow, I've never heard of that before, so it must be God. But if they don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus an intimate relationship with the body of Christ because he's saying we've been baptized into the body. So when you have people saying, I don't want anything to do with the body of Christ, then be wary of what they're selling and giving. Because Jesus, he's coming back for his church. He's coming back for his body, not for a ministry. So it means because we're walking in this body, that means we're walking the power of resurrection. The anointing of the resurrected one is inside of us, and we have to understand covenant on that. I want us to have such an, a release of the Spirit inside of us to wherever you are, and you see, you see issues of compassion, don't call me. Say, I need you to pray for them. You've got the same Jesus inside of you. You don't have a junior one inside of you to step out and see what he'll do and see the power of God. I just want to read to you some things that took place last night of ministry that Pastor Jim texted me. And um, it was a word of knowledge that Pastor Jim had given on a night of ministry last, last Sunday, Sunday night. And the word was, 
that, that verse of scripture said that tr- where the tree is full of sap. In other words, it was green life, life coming back in then. And so this is what it said. Shauna gave the testimony in that night of ministry. Her elbow was on fire and was healed on Monday morning as she realized, and she realized that her knee, was, her knee was healed as well. Tuesday, C.N. said that, we didn't ask permission, I guess. When C.N. said that her neck and shoulders and fingers were healed. On Wednesday, another guy said that he was at, uh, had a hard day and began to, to, to play at, to back, play the ministry, the night of ministry, ministry on the phone back to himself, hearing it again, and heard the word about green with sap, and he was sitting down and said to his knee that has been in pain for 10 years, you're green with sap, and he stood up in no pain. Hallelujah. This is believer's ministry. This is the anointing that abides within all of us. It's biblically based. It's in the word. But when you're around, when you put, get, have in your mind, says, well, God doesn't heal today because, in, and throughout East Texas, there's what's called the doctrine of cessation. Denominations, some of them have it. Doctrine of cessation says that everything that, that miracles did were left with the apostles. When the apostles left, all of the miracles left. You don't find that in scripture because what did the apostles preach? They preach salvation in Christ. So if everything the apostles were doing and preaching left, then we have to say salvation left. Or we become smorgasbord Christians that we pick and choose based on our comfort as to what we want. (laughs) I really thought I'd get a, ah, for that. (laughs) But they didn't go away. They simply established a foundation that the church is based and built upon this. Jesus said, if I by the finger of God have cast out Satan, then the kingdom of God has come to you. He's saying the kingdom of God is a demonstrative ruling and reigning of the king of glory and Christ in us, Colossians 1.27, the anointed one in us is the expectation, hope, expectation of glory. He's saying that when I came inside of you, there's an expectation that you would reveal my glory wherever you are. Have compassion on people. But if all of our self-centered and self-indulging saying, God, what about my needs? What about me? Diane, I heard a word, and we've seen this happen. He said, if, if you'll build a house, then I'll build your house. You pour into other families, I'll pour into your families. You, 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 you give generously, and you be generous with your time and generous with your life, then I'll be generous with you. And I've seen that so much. Or we can spend all the time, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. Give me, give me, give me. I'm Jimmy. Give me, give me, give me. I'm Jimmy. And I can't say, I'm giving this, God, to let you know. Look, see what I'm doing because I'm looking for a return. It doesn't work that way. It's based upon a heart loving after the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, I love the same people that you died for and compassion is released upon it. And I don't have to get on the internet and say, hey, I give 30 cents to a homeless guy the other day to buy, buy you know, a bottle of water. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, Because out of our innermost being, there should be this anointing built inside of us to say, I want to I release who he is. Because I'm willing and I'm obedient. People go and, I need a word from God. I need a word from God. I said, you got a whole word here. Until I've learned to obey this word, I'm not going to be able to hear a personal word. When I was a young guy, 20 years old, I was in a meeting in Kansas City, and if you had a license to preach in your pocket, they let you sit on the platform. That was a big deal in those days. I get to sit on the platform. <laughs> there was a guy named Justin Cornwall. A few of you might know who he is. Just, you just told me how old you were. <laughs> great Bible teacher. His sister, Iverna Tompkins, are great Bible teachers. She was a little scary, but nonetheless, I mean, it was powerful. <laughs> Sitting on the platform, they were both speaking that day. Three prophetic words popped up out of the audience. And so he asked, he said, how many can tell me with the first word that God said this morning? Nobody said anything. How many can tell me the third word? He said, nobody said anything. He just shut his Bible and said, well, if you're not going to hear what God's saying, then what makes me think you're going to hear what I'm saying? (laughs) We tend to put a value on what God said through someone else than put a value on what the Holy Spirit says to us through his word. 
develop an ear to hear, and the way you do that is I'm going to obey the next word that he tells me. My sister, the younger middle one, she got to where she was, she had a rebellious few years. Sorry, Kay, if you're watching. Uh, nobody knows who you are now. And I said, how come I have to do that and she won't do that? You won't tell her to do that, but you're telling me to. And he said, because she won't listen to me. Meaning the fact is, after a while, we get to where we will not listen to him. He'll stop, we'll stop hearing what he says. You develop the ear to hear by responding to every word that he says. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Not he that hath an ear, just listen. Hear implies an action. It doesn't mean an auditory thing. He to hear means the fact that it's entered to my heart and I have understanding as to what to do. We just had a testimony come back from Mexico. I posted it for you that speak Spanish and gave it my little translation. We were in Mexico in last February and the pastor brought this young lady up and she was pregnant and they was, had her husband with her and she was said, the doctors have told me that my baby's not growing faint heartbeat and he's probably going to die in the womb. I heard the Lord say to me, you tell her that I have changed the diagnosis. <laughs> so I said, I know the doctor's diagnosis, but let me tell you what the creator of your baby diagnosed him as. And I said, the baby will be full term, a full good sized baby and will be healthy at the time of delivery. And after I said, oh my. I just got the text back and said, I delivered. I don't know how big it was. It was a good-sized baby, whatever, because it was in meters and, you know, and, you know, electros. I think it was around 7, 7.8. And the baby was full-term, fully developed, and said, we're, showed a picture of the baby. <laughs> Whose report do we believe? God, is it your will? Yes, it's always been my will. If the will of God is to heal the sick, cast out demons, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, you are inside that framework. You don't have to stop and say, God, is it your will? Because there's some people that doesn't believe it's God's will to heal everybody. So what they're saying is that I'm saying I'm resisting the will of God. And thankful that God sometimes just sneaks up on them sovereignly, does it in spite of them because of the compassion for the people. But we carry the body of the anointed. When you lay hands on someone, you're believing. Don't pray prayers that will sound fancy to their ears. Pray prayers that will reach the throne of God. When we were praying over the girl, I prayed a little bit in Spanish, but the rest of it, we were praying in English. She didn't know what we were praying. It wasn't for her ears. It was to connect heaven to earth and to bring things down into, into that being. So God's called us. Into the, into the purpose and plan of God. Our assignment, it hasn't changed. We may not do it as well as others. We may stink at it. But there's a learning curve in the obedience of the Lord. So never look at it and say, well, I, I, I couldn't do it because that ministry, someone does it better than me. It's your assignment. It's not measured by if you prayed the right prayer. When I was learning to ride a bike, man, I had, my knees were bloody and elbows were bloody, but I wanted to ride so desperately that I just kept putting Band-Aids on the Band-Aids till finally, you know, figured out to just keep pedaling. There's times we may not do it well, but we just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Keep trusting. Keep believing. I don't know the details. I don't know how to work out. I just know it will. Keep believing God. And somehow or another, there will be a suddenly that things will break out and you'll see the goodness of the Lord for you. Amen. Trust is really connected with the whole thing with obedience. And if our obedience is based upon so I can tell somebody how good I am, then I've, I've worn my righteousness out to show my righteousness out. Can you minister to those who have, can't give anything back to you? And I'm all for testimonies. I'm not saying that. But it's always about look what the Lord has done. Amen. When you hear a word, it is to invoke the will of God Amen. and him saying, it is me, come. It is me, I'm willing. I'm activating, I'm agreeing with you. So now the next thing is, I'm willing, you come. 
When God says, I'm willing, and we don't respond, what we're doing is rejecting his goodness and rejecting who he is. I honestly believe that we're coming to the time when the signs and the wonders of the body of Christ are going to be so, so insurmountable that we won't even be able to tell it all. It'll become more normal to heal the sick. It'll be more normal the demons want to flee than every once in a while because we're operating as believer's ministry, not some fivefold ministry. I'm sorry that we put definitions on people. I'm sorry we put titles on people. I don't like, I don't live in them. When I go place, they say, what do you want me to call? And I say, Carrie's fine with me. It's what my mother said. <laughs> I don't need to have a title. In fact, let me just show, suit up and show up and surprise them all. If they don't like it, then I hope they don't remember a name. <laughs> But the believers shall do. Believers shall heal the sick. The believers shall. So it is a believer's ministry. So if you need, you need to say, well, I've never been ordained. Well, just raise your right hand. I'll do it now. <laughs> Be set in to the body of Christ. Be set in to the calling and the gifting of the Lord. And if you have to tell somebody your title, then you don't have it. If you have to tell somebody you're a general and explain to them how powerful you are, you probably don't have it. But when you just simply come in the love and the humility of the Father, there's somehow or another he steps in front of us and he's glorified with him. Stand with me.